this is Death Comes at the End, the murder of Agatha Christie. <laughs> um, I didn't do it. <laughs> Death made them joyful. Searching for a body is a task for a rainy day. And since the weather complied, the two girls could cuddle in to light each other's cigarettes, looking charmingly practical in Wellington boots. Ice cream vendors bruised the mood. The children slobbering over cones were excitement put too literally. 15,000 amateur sleuths had arrived by the trainload to aid in the search. Some had come, lantern in hand, equipped with maps of Surrey and much perused news articles detailing the clues police had strung together over the last few days. Christie's sixth novel, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, was still writing the bestseller list when she had disappeared. The facts were this. On December 3rd of 1926, Christie left her home in Surrey, England, and drove toward an area called Newlands Corner, where her car was later found abandoned in a chalk quarry. No one knew why the novelist had left home in a hurry, telling no one where she was going, and apparently had driven into a ditch. Had she tried to commit suicide? Was she dead, injured, somewhere alone? The obsession began immediately. During the great search, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of Sherlock Holmes, got so caught up in the mystery that he stole one of Christie's old gloves and gave it to a medium for study. No one knows how he got the glove exactly, possibly by bribing a housemate or some other Holmes bit of detective work. Some of the volunteer sleuths were organized by police into search parties that fanned out in concentric circles and moved like knights over a chessboard grid. This grid was interrupted by a long white road slashing through the fairy tale lushness of the downs, climbing steeply toward a hilltop and an abandoned barn. From there, one could see the thousands of black jacketed figures, like crows, high stepping through the wet with their eyes trained on the ground. Though it was a fitting place for a murder, Christie's body would not be found in the barn, nor as some had prophesied in the dark waters of the nearby silent pool. As the searchers wandered through the lush green downs, they invented new ways for Christie to die. Christie had worked at a drug dispensary during the war and was particularly inventive with poison. Had she, like one of her characters, licked a poisoned postage stamp? Perhaps she had been drugged and abducted, left for dead somewhere in these very hills. Each shout of discovery brought dozens running to investigate, slipping in their haste to be the first to discover the crumpled body, but each new clue turned out to be a dud. A purse that had been stolen long ago, its silken insides turned inside out and left to rot. A sweater left behind on a warm day or forgotten after a tryst. A note by Christie herself, which was discovered to be a fake. Christie's fans had become authors themselves, struggling to put together a narrative to string each clue together like beads on a broken necklace. But as the tenth day dawned, it was still a story without an ending. As authors in search of an ending, Christie's most passionate admirers found themselves in the strange position of plotting her death. To avoid, uh, to avid newspaper readers, it was as though a Christie mystery had migrated into real life. As experts in her plot twists, they should have been fully qualified to solve this mystery. But one of her biggest flaws as a writer had also marred this true crime story. In a Poirot or Miss Marple mystery, there was always a wealth of vital information that the audience needed to know to solve the puzzle, but which was withheld until the final pages. When critics called foul, Chrissy replied that the murderer was always the most obvious person. What she didn't say was that they only became obvious in retrospect. Mr. Archibald Christie was a Sir Lancelot type. The man Agatha Christie had married in a fit of romantic passion, a dashing young officer with a mustache, who had always resented her success. During the search, Archie had remained barricaded behind the gates of his home, refusing to speak to the press, and then on the 11th day, he got up early, shaved, dressed, and braced himself to wade through the crowd that had been waiting outside his gate for more than a week. Although he said nothing as he made his way through the crowd to a waiting car driven by policemen, word got out. The police had a lead. Christie had been spotted at the posh Harrogate Spa and Hotel by a banjo player in the hotel band. Archie took the train to Harrogate and, as though taking a cue from one of his wife's novels, hid himself behind a newspaper in the lobby to wait for the mysterious woman the police believed was his wife. He had reason to believe they were right because the name she had checked in under was Teresa Neal, the name of his mistress. What Archie had neglected to tell the police 
was that the night before she disappeared, Agatha, he had called Agatha from the hotel to say that he and his mistress were getting married. She had known of the affair, but her friends thought, but her friends said that she had still hoped that they would reconcile. Archie hiked the paper up before his eyes as the woman in the rose-colored skirt and jacket came down the stairs for breakfast. It was her. He rose to meet her, and as he approached, she showed no surprise, but instead held out her hand for him to shake and introduced herself to her husband as though they had never met. Archibald Christie sent out a release that his wife had a damaged brain, possibly amnesia, from the car accident, but the public was not convinced. Some claimed it was a publicity stunt, while others held out hope for something more nefarious. Following the Occam's razor hypothesis, in which the simplest explanation is usually right, it is likely that she planned to get away from her cheating husband and things just got out of hand. But the simplest explanation is not the most interesting. Life may conform to Occam's razor, but in detective fiction, the simplest explanation is never correct. Unless, of course, it is the narrator all along. While reality hasn't the least obligation to be interesting, fiction does. And for a mystery to work, it has to have an interesting solution. So, for over 80 years, armchair detectives have been trying to find out the truth about Agatha's disappearance. A dozen books have been published, and they're still coming. He's not standing up yet. Um, even last year. <laughs> the real question is not what happened during those 11 missing days, but why we are still trying to solve the murder that never happened. Maybe when we read detective fiction, we also enter into a fugue state, exchanging our identities for that of a detective, which explains why we feel so betrayed. In imagining all the ways to get away with murder, we become killers ourselves.